Am I audible? Can you hear me? Good. I'll try to speak up. First, of course, I want to express very warm thanks to the people who have allowed Sam, Professor Turner and myself to be here today, to the to IAT, to the Institute, to the University, um, to this conference, to the Congress, uh, and perhaps most to, to Laura, Laura Large, who's, who we've both known for some years now and, and have worked with, but who has facilitated our being here today. As you just heard, um, a lot of what I'll be speaking about this morning uh, relates to my work for English Heritage, the National Heritage Agency for the, uh, the England part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It's a complicated, it's a small country, but complicated country. And I used to work for the English part of the Heritage Agency, during which I became, as you've just heard, involved in landscapes. There's my title. Uh, it's about historic landscape characterization. Okay, thank you. Historic landscape characterization, which I will usually call HLC. And I'll try to explain simply the uh, origins and evolution of this, this method that we've used in England and in a few other countries. And, toward, and in the second part of my talk, I will uh, try to put it into the broader context of European of the evolution of European heritage and landscape management policy. Okay. At my age, eyesight begins to be weaker. <coughs> oh, I can see what this one is now. Yeah, this is, the, the, this is a contents page, if you like, I'm, just to give you some idea of the subjects I'll be speaking about as, as we move onwards. The various photographs are put in for for um, relief, but there are also photographs mainly of, of English historic landscapes of various sorts to give you some idea of the sort of fabric, physical remains that we're dealing with with HLC. So I will do, do a short introduction so that you actually know what HLC looks like and then speak about its history and its aims, then a little bit about why we started doing HLC, which isn't immediately apparent perhaps. And then in two or three sections, I will speak about how we used HLC to escape from the, um, the tyranny of only dealing with archaeological sites and heritage buildings as dots on maps to look at the gaps between, to look at the whole of the historic environment. Um, then a little bit about how the, the HLCs were made in the national program. I won't speak too long about the techniques because I think Sam Turner will, will do that as well. And I will focus particularly towards the end on, on urban landscapes, which our historic landscape work moved on to in its later years. Having begun with rural areas, we rapidly moved on to characterizing cities and towns. Uh, and then I'll step, sidestep slightly to speak about how some people have used HLC to look at um, the question of forward planning, spatial planning, territorial planning, how we help to inform how decisions are taken. And then I'll show you an example of a, a small city in eastern England called Lincoln. And finally, as I said, I'll spend 10 or 15 minutes speaking about the wider European background. That's broadly speaking what um, the National Programme of Historic Landscape Characterization looks like if simplified to a national level. As you see from the map on the right, this is the English part of the United Kingdom. Uh, Scotland have their own analogous, similar system. Wales have have slightly different methods, but they can be um, used together, obviously. Um, but whilst that, whilst that was a map of the whole of England in a simplified form, the actual work was carried out at, at a local government level, which we call counties. There are about 50 or 60 in England, and each coloured area on that map is a county. So that's a map of the HLC project, to give you an idea of their scale. Most of them are something like 60, 70, 80 kilometers across. Not particularly large areas, but, but large enough. And as the program moved, moved from its origins in 1994 in a county called Cornwall in southwest England, on the left, uh, on your left, <laughs> uh, on your left, county in Cornwall, which is a relative simple method and it's hard to believe, but that was produced on paper with coloured pencils. 
Uh, shortly after that, in the later 90s, we began to use geographical information systems and the method got a lot more detailed and complicated so that by about 20, 2010 thereabouts, the county of Sussex in southeast England, which you can see, which you can see on the map here, Cornwall, Cornwall and Sussex, they just taken, well, Sussex are taken at random, there's, there's many more I could have shown just to show the extent to which the method became more complicated, more sophisticated, more nuanced as the years went on. But whilst the national programme was mainly carried out at that county scale, HLC can be carried out and used at many other scales. So there, there are examples of county scale HLC, again Cornwall, and the top one is Northumberland, the area to the north of Newcastle in northeast England. Um, but from those, those county level HLCs, it's possible to produce regional simplifications, as this one for the southwest, where the scale changes and the amount of detail changes and more information is brought in or taken out. But in the other direction, it's possible to do HLC at very small areas. That's the, the site of, an, of, of a disused hospital to the west of Newcastle, where HLC techniques were used to help the planners decide how to reuse this hospital and turn it into housing areas and, and commercial areas. And moving up the scale, it was used quite early on for small towns in Lancashire in this case, in northwest England, two towns where the characterization was used to inform planning. Uh, larger cities like Lincoln, the one I'll speak about later, and, and even major urban conglomerations. This is Greater London. And the, the green area didn't show countryside, that simply showed 1920s, 30s, and later housing. So the whole of that is an urban area. Nowhere near as big as Bellow, in terms of extent, probably. But nevertheless, the most complicated exercise we've done, probably. Very briefly, um, a single HLC isn't just one map, it's a complicated GIS system with just one layer of, of um, spatial polygons, but those host hold many layers of attributes of data to do with the type of landscape, its history, its previous appearances, its, its even earlier appearances, and they can be used in various ways. So the map on your left is of a simple, high-level, broad classification, bringing in more information at the types level, which is much more detailed. You get a more complicated map. And then the final map on your, on your right is bringing in to play a, a lot of the more detailed attributes, and you get a map that's almost diff difficult to use at this scale. But it can go beyond that. It can go further to the right and bring in even more detail for smaller areas and become, by using the earlier historical layers, become more um, sophisticated again. And that's just a, that's one of the smallest English counties. You can hardly see it on the location map, Bedfordshire in the southeast. And as I said, it can also be urban, so that's the Greater London map I just showed you, which I won't spend too long talking, what an aim that I'm talking about, it's simply there as an example. But we also, towards the end of the programme, began to look at the sea as well, and historic seascape characterisation, which required a different methodology completely, so I won't talk about it today, to any great extent, but four layers of GIS mapping for the seabed, for the water itself, for the surface of the sea and so on, which allow various, things, various amounts of information to be put into the marine planning system, for um, uh, managing fishing, for sh directing shipping routes, for offshore wind farms, wind turbines, for offshore mining and so on. And I won't speak about seascape, but it did exist, because all of this is explained very well on the, the Historic England webpage. English Heritage is now called Historic England, and on their webpage, if you go into their research section, you can follow your way through to descriptions of HLC and some of the publications. And a lot of the HLC projects are available as GIS data downloadable from the Archaeological Data Service, Archaeology Data Service at York University. So again, if you go into that, you'll be able to capture the NHLC and, and explore it yourselves. So I won't talk any more about the methodologies. I'll go back to the beginning and, and the reasons for it. In the early 1990s or the late 1980s, there was a, the development of a method called landscape character assessment mainly by geographers and planners and landscape architects, which produced uh, maps of areas based on character areas, which were he heavily informed by topography and the, the visual effects. And some of us felt that whilst it made some allowance for the historical depth of the landscape, it was insufficient. So we 
began to develop historic landscape characterization to sit alongside it and to be combined with it later. We've never quite achieved properly the integration of the two methods. You would have thought it was possible for a group of people with the right set of skills to do both simultaneously, but it's very difficult to bring disciplines together sometimes. So they are still separate, but they are used, once they're made, they're used together by planners and spatial planners and local authority decision makers. And we recently, with a couple of colleagues, I brought together examples of both Health Landscape Character Assessment and HLC from not many from Britain, mainly from Europe and a few from other parts of the world in, in that book. So that might give you some more background as well, which I haven't got time to go into today. These are examples of some of those at national scale in Europe, at the whole of Europe, um, Portugal, Nor Norway, Austria, Netherlands and, and, and England again, national maps of landscape character assessment, which are really useful for all sorts of management purposes. But when you look hard at them, you, it's difficult to see anything other than topography, nature and visual appreciations. So as I say, that's why we felt the need to do HLC, because we wanted to add to those sort of projects the effects of human action and human processes in the past, the, um, the, the very deep historic dimension of, of the landscape, not just the last 50 or 100 years, but, but thousands of years. It's not always visible, but it's, it's part of a, an action a thousand years ago. It's part of a long chain of events, and it, it in some way influences later action. So it's still there in the landscape, even if it's can't be seen. Sometimes it's there below the ground, obviously. Sometimes it's simply there in knowledge, because we try to bring in not just what you can see, but what you also know about in other ways, either through prospection or simply um, through cognition, that we know that the landscape has been inhabited in, in Britain for 10,000 years, and that's part of our landscape. And we're very keen in HLC as well, because landscape cat assessment tends to produce a, a picture of the present day landscape with a sort of hidden, almost implicit suggestion that it should remain the same and ha always has been the same. People talk about the timeless English landscape. Well, it's not timeless, it's full of time, very full of time, it's always changed. So we've tried to always keep in historic landscape characterization the idea of change through time. that has gone on and on, layers and layers changing, sometimes destructively, sometimes constructively, but always changing. And in the end, we more, some of us, certainly I did, came to the view that it's not possible to just destroy a landscape, you can only change it. So when people in certain parts of the heritage world talk about this development will destroy a landscape. My answer is, no, it won't destroy it. It will change it. You may not like the change, but the landscape will carry on in some way. And HLC tries to bring that attitude towards change, but I'll come back to it later. Um, I, think I'll, I think I'll skip that one for the moment, except to say that, as it said at the bottom, from the very beginning, the aim of HLC was first and foremost to be a practical tool for the management of landscape rather than purely research. And some of the ideas behind HLC were characterization as a way of seeing. Landscape, of course, is also a way of seeing the world, and the two things fit together very well. Um, I'll just run through some of these. An important point of HLC was that we were looking at the whole landscape. With, there's no areas which aren't historic landscape. There's no white areas, there's no blanks. So it's not like a map of, I don't know, a map of designated landscapes or a map of... Um, UNESCO cultural heritage landscapes with areas in between which have fallen through. Everything in, in our maps has some sort of historic character. Um, and I've mentioned we're talking about change in creationists at the bottom, that the landscape is moving on. It's, I suppose you could, all of that could be summarized by the near the bottom, the, the line about managing change everywhere. We're not protecting the landscape, we're not aiming to be preservationists, we're aiming to manage change to the landscape to affect how change is made. There's a lot of publications on it, many of which are on the Historic England webpage, and some aren't, but nevertheless, you'll be able to find them down. And HLD really come from, comes from a, a context in heritage management in England where this sort of thing were, were being protected. Individual archaeological sites on the left, an abandoned medieval village, designed landscape. Some of those were being protected, but the gaps in between them, the areas around them, were not. Um, so on the one hand, HLC was trying to expand what heritage meant and what the practice of heritage meant by bringing in this landscape dimension. But on the other hand, we were trying to expand what landscape meant to geographers and planners and decision makers by giving it some heritage dimension. So we were trying to influence two quite different audiences. <coughs> 
and as I said, to bring time depth to the landscape and to look at management of change, this is getting repetitive. Um, and those are the sort of management tasks we're aiming at, spatial planning, obviously territorial planning, I'm not quite sure what the word is in Brazil. Um, more detailed development control, the response of individual proposals for change. The management of agricultural policy, which is quite a big topic for government in, in Europe because the common agricultural policy in the European Union, there's been a lot of influence through things like landscape character assessment and historic landscape characterization on the way that agriculture is, is managed by government. We're trying to raise public awareness of, of the historic aspects of the landscape and, and also obviously contributing towards understanding and research. And if, you've, if you can find the Using Historic Landscape Capitation book on the Historical Link webpage, you'll find examples, some, some years old now, of where this has been achieved. And I think this is being updated at the moment, so in two or three years' time, there may be some new examples. I'll skip that one. Right, I mentioned earlier that um, we're also, as well as trying to add a landscape dimension, a landscape aspect to heritage, we're also trying to escape from the idea of dots. Um, and we do that first by considering the whole of the landscape, as I said, no, no gaps, the whole site, by looking at understanding. And the, pro the problem with the old dots approach, and sorry, this, is, this is all a bit autobiographical, that, that's, an, that's a castle I excavated in the late, when I was an archaeologist in the late 70s, early 80s. This is where I live now, so I tend to use examples I'm familiar with. Uh, St Albans is a, was one of the oldest cities in, in England, it's a 2,000 year old city. You can, an important early medieval and medieval abbey, um, design park to the west, streets of 15th, 16th, 17th century houses in the center, and so on. But in terms of heritage knowledge, th all of that is summarized by a few pink, pink areas, a few blue dots for individual buildings, and, and the concept of the whole disappears quite fast. And even if you go back to the historic maps, you, you can see how much is, how much is missing from people's daily landscape by simply focusing only on heritage highlights. Another example, this is the whole county, Lancashire. Again, autobiographical, this, I was born near the, near the top of this. Um, this is a map of all the known archaeological sites in Lancashire. It tells you where people have been working archaeologically. So that cluster of blue dots there is because somebody built a road and there was lots of field work. It didn't actually tell you anything about the actual distribution. And that's where, the, that's where the, the county council archaeologist lived. So he would spend his weekends finding sites. <laughs> so A, it's not comprehensive, because it depends on where people worked. And secondly, it tells you nothing at all about landscape. It's simply a map of dots. And in contrast, the historic landscape characterization for Lancashire gives some historic character, with its deeper descriptions behind the GIS map, some identity. Another way of looking at it is uh, some years ago now, a proposal to build many houses north of London. Uh, the, the two maps you see at the top show the, the known, the protected actually, archaeological sites and the protected uh, historic buildings. Again, it tells nothing about geography, they're just avoidance maps, things we wanted the developers not to touch but didn't give any other guidance. The HLC gives a completely different picture of what developers and planners and architects might need to know. Uh, when that's turned into a a value-based assessment of which areas are most fragile and might, might be changed unacceptably, you end up with, with a, a sensitivity map, which I'll come on to later, which is much more useful to tater to architects. The, um, I, forget, I forget the colour scheme now, the, the bright pink areas are the ones where you will do least damage to this type of character. There's other things to take into account, there's the nature of the ecology, there's socio-economic issues, but this is a map designed to broaden the planner's perspective from simply avoiding a few sites to thinking how the landscape might be improved by um, what, what they're doing. And that's a very typical from southwest England, I think, medieval landscape. Uh, I, won't, I won't speak about this because Sam will, uh, how they're made. I've always, I've always argued that HLC is a, a work of interpretation, not of recording. We're not recording what's already known, we're interpreting what's already known and producing something new. Multiple sources, historic maps particularly, but many other things. Um, uh, photographs. Perhaps most of all, the, the, 
the knowledge of the people making the HLC, sometimes built up over 10, 20, 30 years of working in an area, and their knowledge of other areas too, because you can extrapolate from one area to another area and say, well, this landscape is probably of this sort of character. And just quickly run through an example of how it's made. This is the Lancashire map I showed you. That is the known archaeological sites and the known uh, design landscapes and things. If you take those away and start from scratch with urban areas, with suburban areas, um, infrastructure, two or three different types of woodland, older and more modern, things of that sort, different types of coastal marshland and, and field patterns, and you gradually build up to the map we saw before. And of course, it's possible to go into the database and look at what the map might have looked like 500 years ago. So that's a model, an estimate of Lancashire 500 years ago, which is really quite different to Lancashire today. Now it feels in the past it was wetland areas, lots more woodland and so on and so on. So you've got an element, element of change already. And in urban areas that change is even more drastic. Uh, Liverpool, the northwest England. Um, two different areas of Liverpool sh showing the pre-urban landscape from the 19th century ordinance uh, maps. In that one, the 19th century houses were were dropped into an existing landscape, and you can still see, if you look, if you were, if you had long enough to look, you can still see the roads, the field boundaries, patterns surviving in the modern townscape. So people actually walk down their streets, and they're following the line of five or eight hundred year old hedges. For example, the the skeleton of the landscape survives, and in this slightly modernist approach, elsewhere, in, not very far away, half a kilometre away, the architects decided to that they had a a blank sheet. They clearly didn't, they had, they had the landscape already, but they, in effect, kept the roads and nothing else, and they imposed this, this modern design onto it. And those two areas have a completely different historic character and a different perceptive, perceptive feel to their residents because of the, the extent to which you can and can't see um, the past as well as the present. And this, uh, the urban HLCs allow us to plot the evolution of a city this is Wolverhampton in the West Midlands of England. Uh, the, green, the green areas are field patterns, and already by whatever date that is, I can't see it. What are the days at the top? <laughs> already the city was quite large, but it gradually grows and expands, and industry comes in coal mining, iron working, metal working. Industry comes in, industry begins to fail, and now it's almost entirely housing with hardly anything else going on. And that's one of the interesting things about this particular urban HLC is that it's possible to plot the, the abandonment of industrial land. We sort of tend to assume that Britain began to lose all its industrial powers and powers in the 1980s, but in fact, 50% of, of existing industry was already disused by a much earlier date. Again, I'm sorry, I can't read the numbers. By the 1880s, by the 1880s, half the industrial land of Wolverhampton was already post-industrial, for example. And there's another cycle later on. So Wolverhampton is one of those places where you can get three, four, five different major land uses, landscape types, within the space of a century. It's a very dynamic landscape, and so that sort of landscape you, you expect to continue to be dynamic, or one hopes it does. Uh, much smaller town in Cornwall, and, and a, quite a different way of doing it, um, that's just a map showing the, chronolo the chronological expansion of the town. But taking the centre, you can turn it into character areas. These are, it's a different way of doing it. This is the landscape character assessment approach. But each area of the town, from the, from the dark red in the centre, which is the historic core around the church, to its, to its immediate late medieval expansion, and so on and so on, um, has a different character, different architectural styles, different shapes of streets, and so on. And having identified one of them, in this case the core, you can, the planners were able to start suggesting that in this particular part of the town, the following planning policies would be, would be good things to follow. In a different part of the town, different planning policies. So you're beginning to get to a, a local sensitivity. And then this, this, the example of the site level HLC I showed before, this abandoned or disused hospital in northeast England, where we did an HLC for them to try to guide them in turning it into a, a large number of houses, but while still enabling the future residents to see that they were in a historic landscape of some description, not to keep everything, but to keep patterns. I think probably, understandably, the building at the top, which is the origins of the hospital, a private house in the 19th century was being kept, but originally nothing else would, and I think we persuaded them to keep some of the structure and some of the buildings. 
Um, Milton Keynes, one of Britain's few real modernist towns built in the 1960s, designed for cars. <laughs> Big rectilinear grid, easy to get lost in. Um, a proposal some years ago to, to expand it, to build houses. The architects simply thought that the best way to expand it was to build houses, to build houses all the way around. Because, you know, what's the difference? East or West, it's still countryside and may well build on it. But in fact, the, the local authority, HLC, demonstrated that for a whole number of reasons, the degree of loss of hedgerow patterns, uh, the degree of survival of 18th and earlier layers of landscape, the degree of change in the last 20 few decades, that the area to the, to the West was a much more sensitive historic landscape with much, much deeper character than the area to the Northeast. And that perhaps that initial idea, simply building around the city, needed some more careful thought. Sensitivity. The, the, this, is, this is one of several examples we've, we've got of people using HLC to say whether or not a, a, a piece of land is highly sensitive or not very sensitive to change. And each of these maps shows a different sort of change. Major change in the sense of large-scale building work. Um, tall structures, in this case in the middle of Cornwall, wind turbines rather than towers, but the same principle applies. Um, slow change, little tiny things changing all the time, and then deliberate woodland planting to bring more trees into the country. And as you can see, the, the sensitivity of landscape to the four different things changes. It's not simply enough to say this is an important historic landscape, it's sensitive. You need to ask, sensitive to what? Because some landscapes can take some change, but not others. And HLC allows you to do that. And here, some years ago, there's an attempt to create a major new, new forest in the center of England, the little green blob in the middle. That was the official initial starting point that the only sensitive areas were the, the browns and the yellows and all that pale green. All that pale green uh, area was identical, was homogenous, and trees planted in one part of that would be the, have the same effect as trees planted elsewhere. But if you take the eastern end of it, which is part of a county called Leicestershire, that's the diversity of field patterns that that area has. Some of the fields had mixed in with coal mining from the middle, med medieval period onwards and the small and the very intricate landscape. Others are enclosed, as in bottom right, from uh, grazing land reasonably recently in the 17th or 18th, 19th centuries. Um, some have been turned into private parks in the 16th century, as in the top and so on. And to say that such a diversity of landscape type is equally sensitive to, to woodland planting is, is, is nonsensical, at the very least. And the Leicestershire map, compared to that pale green one, is, is much more complicated. And they produce two, well, several layers of sensitivity assessment based on big areas of woodland and small areas of woodland. Again, different levels of sensitivity because you can put, there's some areas you can have small patches of woodland, you wouldn't want big ones and vice versa. And compared those very new ones and sophisticated maps to the original one again, you can see how, in the bottom right hand corner, you can see how HLC brings a lot more detail and depth Um, right, I promise you an example of Lincoln, the Lincoln Townscape Assessment. This is very easy to find yourself on the web page because there's a really, I've checked, it still exists. Um, that's the problem, you, you make something and five, ten years later it may not be there anymore. But this one did exist, it's called Heritage, Heritage Connect Lincoln. If you go to that web page you'll find all of this information and a lot more available. If you're in Lincoln, if by some chance you travel to England and find yourself in this small town in the east, um, your mobile phone will guide you around from area to area and tell you what the historic character of the town is that you're looking at. I mean, it's mainly known for its cathedral and its castle, but it's also a modern city with um, 19th and 20th century industry and, a, and an increasingly growing 20th, late 20th, 21st century university. So it's a very diverse town with a lo another long history, another 2,000 year old city. Um, and this project used the approach of character areas, they divided the whole, the whole municipality into 110, I think, I forget the numbers, about 100 areas based on the character of the townscape, the type of building, the amount of open space and so on. Uh, just to give you an idea of those two at the top on the very edge, some of the more recent ones. Because the, um, the center of the 
late 20th century urban housing areas. So we didn't have any chronological cutoff points. We went to the very edge of the city council and to, the, and, and to yesterday, in effect. So there's nothing which is too young to be in this map. And then we looked at many, many different aspects. One was different types of street layout and how a historic street layout, sometimes in the Roman period, like the bottom left one, is still to some extent influenced in the modern day street pattern. If you want to start changing that, you might end up really doing damage to the way the city works in terms of daily movement and identity and use and so on. Um, we looked at the bottom right hand corner, I think it's that one. We looked at things like what it feels like to walk down a street. Is the street closed to you? Is it hostile? Is it simply blank walls? Or did it have windows and doorways? Or is it no wall at all? Is it open space? Are the houses set back? And if they're set back, is it by this much or by 100 metres? To get an idea of what it feels to walk down some of these streets, which is also a product of their history, obviously. And these are just some screen grabs from the, the mobile phone application, which gives you lots of information about each of the character areas, their history, gives you historic maps going back in time to, in some cases, well, I forget how long, about 19th century, certainly early 19th, gives you an architectural um, summary of the, of the buildings, what their main characters are. And also, on the bottom right-hand corner, allows people to give their responses to what it's like to either be in these areas or live in these areas. Now, to be honest, not many people do that. But if there's ever a development proposal that they don't like, then they'll start using it. But the main use of it is, is to help the town planners and people wanting to build and change buildings in the town. Because the first thing, when this was first completed, the first thing that uh, somebody is seeking permission to do something in the town, they were, they were asked, have you looked at the townscape assessment? Have you designed your building to follow the character of the area that you're in? And sometimes, that in, as in the, the middle picture, that involves the original proposal being uh, not rejected, but um, has to be reconsidered. Not because it's too big or too large, because it's not big enough. Sometimes it works the other way, that people, developers, architects were too cautious, and the planners wanted a building which was larger, because buildings on corners of streets, as that one, were always bigger than the streets and so on. So it's, it's a, it's a two-way iterative process of, of negotiation that this in institutes. And both the publications from it, the top one, which describes the methodology and how it was made and some of the results, and the bottom one, which describes examples of how it's been used until about eight years ago, six years ago perhaps, how it's been used in practice, are both on the web page as well, and they can be downloaded. Right. Assuming the ticking down clock is correct, I've probably got time to look at the, the, this wider context, I, I promised. What here, what here I've called the broader, the broader policy context of historic landscape characterization, and not in the United Kingdom, but at a, mainly at a European scale, occasionally wider. Um, HLC was really started in 1994, 1995, um, around about the same time as in the Council of Europe, they were beginning to think about a convention which would not just be about buildings or monuments or nature sites, but about landscape as a whole. And all the way through the 90s, HLC was developing and evolving, and so was European thinking about landscape. So I suppose you could say that HLC became, came to its more or less mature form in about 2000, and in 2000 as well is when the European Landscape Convention was opened, published, after some years of discussion, negotiation, consultation. There was a point at which the European Landscape Convention would have been a convention to produce a list of the most important European landscapes. But you, you won't find that in the convention because during the discussion processes, the idea that landscape is everywhere and it's more important to look at all landscape managed to push the, the, the um, selective designation aspects away, which is a, a pretty close reflection to what happened in the early 1990s in Britain when we were actually asked by government in 92 or 3, I say we, English Heritage, and the Countryside Commission, another government agency, were asked to, asked to work out how to produce a list of the best landscapes. And in practice, we refused to do that. And the Countryside Commission went off and produced something called the New Map of England, which was a, 
and national map showing all landscapes and we would often produce a start landscape characterization, which again had no gaps. Because we were both, even at that early stage, convinced that to simply list the best 50 landscapes of England would miss out too much, would devalue everything else on the grounds that people say, well, this landscape isn't on the list, it can't be important, but it's important to its local residents, it's important for all sorts of other reasons. So all the way through both the evolution of HLC and the evolution of the European Landscape Convention, the ERC, there's, this, there's been this resistance to go down the pathway of designated landscapes, which of course UNESCO did around about the same time with their cultural landscapes list. But we've, we've managed to um, avoid doing that and try to go for this much wider view. But there's also, which I'll come on to, the, the, the Faro Convention on the value of cultural heritage for society, which, which is five years later than the um, ELC, but in effect they're siblings, uh, they're like sisters or brothers. They're both saying the same thing from different perspectives and about different topics. So the ELC speaks about landscape, the Faro Convention speaks about heritage, but they're both saying the same thing, as I hope to show in a moment. And then five years later, uh, an organization called the European Science Foundation, who produced science policy briefings to try to guide the direction of research, uh, commissioned one on landscape because they wanted to experiment with the inter interdisciplinarity and they thought landscape was a good guinea pig, a good place to do that. Most of their science policy briefings are about um, space, quantum physics, advanced biomedics, genetics and so on. So it's quite difficult for us to um, fit landscape into the, into the style of the document because it's not what they were used to. But we managed in the end to produce a document which says the same sorts of things as those two conventions about the importance of landscape as an integrating, uni unifying concept, which, is ready, which could potentially um, address global challenges way beyond the idea of landscape protection. And then finally, I'm not sure the date is quite right, because of course that was discussed long before 2011, but the UNESCO recommendation on historic urban landscape, Hull, is in effect bringing the ideas of the ELC and of Faro into the UNESCO context. This idea of slow development of, 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 of urban landscapes, the role of people and so on. But I'll come back to those, all those in a minute. The, the ELC has three major contributions. I mean, other people might say slightly different, identify different major contributions, but um, what I see really important in the ELC is are these three. The fact it has a very simple, <coughs> comprehensive, but powerful definition of what landscape is. Now, that's important because for decades, people discussing landscaping groups, especially interdisciplinary groups, would spend days and days discussing what they meant by landscape, trying to define it. And they never got onto the really important or interesting discussions of what to do about it. And in effect, the, so far at least, in European um, landscape research, landscape thinking, nearly everyone, with some reservations here and there, accepts that the ELC definition is a starting point, and we can, we've been able to move on to the more important questions. Um, it has an insistence on multiple values, which is the same as HLC does, that there isn't only one way of looking at landscape, there's not only one way to value it, but individual people have their own valuations. Landscape's a very individual thing. It's collective as well, obviously, but it's an individual thing. It's, what, it's how people perceive it. And thirdly, uh, its definition of scope, landscape isn't only special, it's ordinary, and it's even damaged and degrading areas. They're still landscape, and in some ways, the important ones in terms of action, of management and better planning, are the damaged landscapes. They're the ones that need attention, not the perfectly preserved landscapes, which are, no one's going to do anything really terrible to, but the ones which are run down, badly damaged, and where the majority of people live. They're, those are the landscapes that need real attention. That on the top left corner, <laughs> is the landscape convention definition, and you see what I mean about being simple. It's almost too simple in a way, but you can read into it almost anyth anything that you need to read into it. It's an area, that's probably the biggest flaw, using the word area, but it's an area perceived by people whose character is the result of the action and interaction of natural and or human factors. And with, within that, many disciplines have been able to adapt, adapt that, use it, and, and take it forwards. And then in the other box, I think you'll see the um, definition of scope, special and ordinary landscapes. But also, it's not just rural landscape. Many people use the word landscape, and they have in their head a picture of green countryside, of scenery, of mountains. But landscape is also urban areas, peri-urban areas, industrial areas. It's lakes, it's seascapes. Landscape is a way of seeing the world, 
w whatever sort of world it is. And the convention also sees landscape as a tool for really big social challenges, for identity, for social cohesion, for bringing people together. Landscape's one of the few things that all people share. You know, we don't share politics, we don't share religion, we don't share all sorts of things, but we do share landscape. And if you don't share it, things go really wrong. And the, the um, European Landscape Convention is quite visionary in that it sees landscape as, as one of these goods, one of these good things that might improve the world. And the fact that the Landscape Convention, which used to sit mainly in a section about heritage and so on, Landscape Convention and heritage, for that matter, in the Council of Europe, which isn't the same as the EU, by the way. The Council of Europe is much bigger. It covers the whole of Europe. Uh, 40, I forget how many countries now, 47 or something. Um, the Landscape Convention sits in the section of the Council of Europe that deals with democracy and citizenship, that's where they see landscape as fitting. Not, in an, not an environmental issue, but a human issue to do with society. Which brings us to the Fallow Convention, which is not about how to protect sites, like, like some of the other conventions in the past have been, like Venice and Granada and um, Valletta. It's not the how of heritage, it's the why of heritage. Why is heritage important? Why do we protect it? Why do people use it? And the answer is that it's, it's of social value. And it's frequently referred to as being a people-centered heritage. It's not a people-centered convention, sorry. It doesn't exist because it's speaking about, about heritage objects. It exists because it's speaking about people's interaction to heritage objects, which opens a really big topic, which is can't go into today, obviously. Um, but it gets you into questions about, is heritage the thing, the stuff, or is heritage the process? And if heritage is the process, which process? And I would argue that heritage, first and foremost, is the process of people living. And somewhere down the line, you get to the heritage experts who are doing things about it. But everyone does heritage every single day. You leave your house, and you're immediately in heritage, looking at heritage, interacting with heritage, creating heritage, destroying heritage. It's simply part of life. And the same with landscape, in a sense. Um, the Fowler Convention speaks of of a right to heritage, almost a, they actually call it a human right, that citizens have the right to their own heritage that shouldn't be taken away from them or destroyed or changed without discussion and without their um, permission, if you like. But importantly, it's matched by responsibilities towards other people's heritage. And it's important to know that the Faro Convention was written in the years after the breakup of the, Yugos of the Yugoslavian Republic and the civil wars that went on for several years, in which heritage was used as a weapon. People destroyed bridges deliberately because it was blung into the other side of the argument. They were clearing our ethnic communities because of their heritage and so on. And the Fire Convention is an attempt to say that you can't use heritage as a weapon. You must respect heritage of other people. Um, and that everyone, either alone or collectively, has responsibility for doing that. It's not something that sits with governments, it sits with citizens, with people. And it, it says many of the same things that the Landscape Convention does, this thing about um, plurality of views, that people attribute value to heritage. The value isn't inherent in the heritage in the Fowler Convention. Value is given to heritage by people, and that's where the discussions start to arise. And those are just the slightly dry words of, of two of the articles. About the one, I've chosen the ones about rights and about responsibilities. But behind those sentences is this idea that hedges is, is something which comes from people, not from, not from states or experts. And as a result of those two conventions and everything that went on around them and things like HLC and, and other countries doing their own work in landscape like the Netherlands, for example, and, and Sweden, and Italy particularly, and France, um, because of all that, the, the, the ones very separate concepts, heritage, heritage and landscape, People would say, well, they're completely different. They're coming together now. And speaking personally, I can't tell the difference between heritage and landscape. They're just different ways, different words for, for the same idea, which is that you're looking at the world, deciding what's important, deciding how you, you relate to it. And this is simply a slide to try to explain how they go together. Of course, that isn't really true in real life, because we still have a heritage agency, we have a landscape agency, we have a planning agency and all other agencies. So it, 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 it hasn't taken root, obviously. Even though back in 2000, one of the things the ELC said was that landscape shouldn't be 
There shouldn't be a government department of landscape. Landscape issues should be in all government departments. It should be a cross-cutting theme and main, in the mainstream. And it hasn't happened in many places yet, as you might imagine. But it's exactly the same problem as it, as it is with interdisciplinarity. Very difficult to make people even see the boundaries, let alone climb over them or let alone knock them down. Which is where this document really came in, because this was trying to point out that landscape is a, not just a multidisciplinary topic covering all disciplines, but it goes across the main domains. Landscape is both a scientific issue and a humanities issue, for example. And yet you'll find people sitting in their own little disciplines, hardly reading each other's literature. You can read almost any advanced landscape research paper and look at the bibliography and you'll see only one discipline represented in the bibliography. Very few people read beyond their discipline and yet, and yet there's a massive amount of literature. And the science policy briefing is basically, can I skip one? Basically um, trying to point out that because of this fragmentation, and I've got a very old colleague in the, I mean, <laughs> he's quite old but I've known him for a long time, <laughs> a colleague in the Netherlands who, who summarised this better than anyone I know, he said that um, governments have problems, universities have departments. And the t governments have problems, university departments, and the two things fight against each other. And this science policy brief briefing is an attempt to say that if even a fraction of those boundaries can be broken down, if even occasionally the di disciplines can work together, landscape becomes a really powerful integrative force. And if you, if you look this up on the web page, it's still there under, it's probably on the cost web page these days, not the ESF, because the ESF has changed. Um, you will find claims, it may even be there. Yes, at the bottom. Claims that, lang that landscape properly used, properly integrated, and looking beyond its own self-preservation, if you like, not concerned with protecting landscape, but concerned with all the social values that the Fire Far Convention also talks about. Landscape can address global challenges, like migration. I mean, what is migration but people moving across landscape and asking to share someone else's landscape and leaving their landscape behind? But they don't leave it behind, they bring it with them in their heads. So everything gets mixed together, and landscape is a way to look at the effects of migration on people. Um, food security is a landscape issue. The food is grown on land, and if something touches land, there's a landscape issue because it's to do with power and, and relationship between people. And I forget what else I put on that list, but in that quotation rather, but there's so what the European Union frequently calls the global challenges, that landscape has a claim to be able to address some of those challenges, not necessarily solve them, but to bring new insights into them, but only if it becomes integrated properly. And then the European Commission, which is one of the strands of the European Union, the, the, the smaller organisation in Europe, the 28 member one, well, 28 for the moment, we've been, we're, we've been dragged out unwillingly. Um, even the European Commission has begun to say things like this. And I say even because they, they until recently, haven't had any um, uh, position within heritage. It's not, they've not seen it as one of their competencies, but they've left that to the Council of Europe. That's why I say even, but nevertheless, they're saying the things that have been evolving in the last 10 years about heritage and conservation of heritage, that it should cover the whole landscape, not just sites, and it should become more people-centered. You can see the same words coming out again and again in different organizations now. Doesn't mean to say they'll start changing the world fast, but people are starting to think in the same way. There's lots of emphasis on local communities and de democratic participation and on contemporary needs and so on. And the, the centres that are not in red, old approaches sought to protect heritage by isolating it from daily life. That's sort of the, the that's basically what I was saying before, that heritage is part of life, not something... Heritage isn't what you go on holiday to see, heritage is what you see where, where you live, wherever you live, basically. And that's from an official European Commission. I think it's a, re I think it's a recommendation to the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers um, towards an integrated approach to cultural heritage for Europe. So it's important, it's a short statement, but it's important for all sorts of reasons, not least that it uses the word landscape in the context of heritage management. Which again is what, um, as I said earlier, what the UNESCO Historic Urban Landscape document is doing as well. It's looking at townscapes not as a cluster of, um, not only as a cluster of important architectural sites in the middle of, a, in the historic core of a town, but looking at the whole town as a as a landscape in which people live, which people perceive, as the European Landscape Convention puts it, perceive in their landscapes, and it emphasizes ubiquity and time, depth, and chrono chronology. And in doing so, in emphasizing the deep chronology, it emphasizes past change and therefore inevitably future change. So it's a, 
a forward-looking, non-preservationist type approach. It's highly unlikely that any town following uh, the historic urban landscape methodology would have their site taken off the World Heritage List, for example, which some cities do, because they've done something which the UNESCO thinks is not quite right. So I think Hull is a big step forward for UNESCO in that it's moving them very close to all these other things I've been talking about. And then one final ingredient to this sort of complicated dish I'm trying to serve, serve to you, uh, one further ingredient, the idea of culture in sustainability. And this comes from a, a European project network called Investigating Cultural Sustain Sustainability, which was trying to explore across about taking experts or researchers from about, I forget, 20 countries perhaps in Europe, and a few outside Europe, Canada for example, um, trying to explore how culture is part of sustainable development, because sustainable development is very often couched in terms of ecology, environmental matters, the physical things, whereas culture is also a part of sustainable development. And whilst there have been attempts to say that culture should become a fourth pillar, For example, what is the economy but a cultural construct? It doesn't exist. What is the environment except the product of cultural changes over centuries? So this, this network is, is starting to argue that culture is much more central to sustainable de development than perhaps has been thought. And that quotation, and again, that quotation says some of the things I've been saying in the last um, 50 minutes about heritage and landscape and so on. You'll find a lot of this in that, in that book at the top called Cult <sighs> Culture in, for, and as sustainable development. And there are a lot of case, exact case studies from various parts of the world as well. So we have that extra ingredient of, of um, cultural sustainability or the, or the role of culture in sustainability, which brings in a lot of additional factors. And Sam and I were part of a network recently called Cheriscape, which stands for Cultural Heritage and Landscape. And we, we organized a a session at the final conference of this cultural sustainability network, and we called our session Landscape and Heritage in the Cultural Construction of Everyday Life, which again is reflecting what I've just said. I think Landscape and Heritage are the, integ the integrating power of both of them. So we had connections to this, well I was in both projects actually, that's the connection, but we had connections between our two networks which were very useful to us. And I'll finish by just briefly talking about Cheriscape because that's summarised in the last last three to four years, some of the things I've been talking about. It wasn't a very large project, it was a network of um, five countries, seven organizations in five countries whose logos are down here. And it existed, it's designed to simply hold five conferences. In the end, we organized sessions at other people's conferences, so it was more like eight or 10, but five big conferences, about 100 people each perhaps, drawn from all over Europe and occasionally from other, other parts of the world, to investigate various themes and each conference was designed to be participative with lots of discussion. I think lectures took up less than half the time in our conferences and the other half was various forms of participation, discussion groups of various types and things of that sort. So they were very interactive conferences and they were, they were really exciting to go to because we were constantly hearing new ideas from people and new case studies. And those are the five conferences. Uh, can you, I don't know if you can read the actual titles, but... Um, The idea of landscape and heritage within research. One was about um, community and the relationship between landscape, heritage, research, and community values and things. One was about the environmental aspects and global change in that sense. And then the final one, which we took to Newcastle, was the role of landscape and landscape and heritage in imagination and virtual futures and thinking about the future. Not that thinking about the future hadn't been part of all the conferences, but nevertheless, those are our five themes. As you can see at the top left corner, we came to the project with the ideas I've been talking about, HLC, Faro, and so on, and we left the project with a fairly small, short document called Key Messages, which again you can find on the web page, the address there, cheriscape.eu, and the web page is still live, just about. So I keep going back to this idea of the difficulty of keeping things going forever. Uh, and we identified, we summarised things as six major challenges, and they're all challenges which stop. It's a bit like the science policy briefing, the ESF one, is a 
the challenges which stop this idea, this fusion of landscape and energy is really fulfilling its potential because the governance structures aren't there. Everything is fragmented at governance or it's marginalised to the edges of the government spectrum of departments, for example. Uh, the, de the democratic challenge in that we really haven't sorted out, worked out, learned how to get real democratic participation. You only really get communities talking with us about heritage when something's going wrong, when something's being threatened in their village or their town. So we haven't sorted out a democratic particip participative challenge. We haven't really addressed the question of landscape rights, which is a much bigger one, landscape justice, landscape equality. I have one, everyone ought to have the right to live in a good landscape, good for their well-being, but not everyone does. And the issues behind that are deeply fundamental that we can't easily deal with, but they're to do with power structures, wealth, inequalities of wealth, and so on and so on. Um, but nevertheless, it, it, we put down as one of our problems this issue of landscape rights, of, of, of justness. Um, scale, we still think scale is an issue because for most people, landscape is a large view, whereas landscape can be a small area, can be a whole county, can be a whole country, can be a whole planet. You can perceive the world as a single landscape and it gives you new insights. So scale is an issue which is hard to cope with. And also scale on the output side, the, the use of these things, the, the scale at which you use them is a, is a problem that hasn't been really resolved. Sharing and learning. Experts come up with ideas about landscape and heritage and communicate to the rest of the world. We don't listen back very often uh, and we don't co-produce information often enough. We should share our knowledge more, we should learn more together. But again, that brings us back to the, landscape, the um, democratic participation problems. And then making connections, which brings us right back to in, in, interdisciplinarity, towards the integration of government departments, all the things we've been talking about. Both landscape and heritage are basically about connections. People with place, people with people, people with nature, people with the non-human. It's all about connections and landscape is a matter of relationships. And finally, just looking ahead, um, Sam and I in Newcastle are, are one of seven universities in a new four-year project called Heavyland. The same sort of theme, heritage landscape. But this one is a training, a training network with 15, or will have, 15 doctoral students in those seven universities across Europe and will produce a, um, a handbook or a manual of landscape and heritage policy and guidance and so on and so on. But that's, that's for next year. But we're hoping that it will pick up some of the threads I've spoken about in the last few minutes, bring forward the Chairs of Ideas, bring forward some of the science policy briefings and, and push ERC and FARO a bit further along in people's consciousness that we don't promise to solve all the, all the problems or address all the global challenges. So thank you for your attention.